Hello, everyone. Um, great to see you all here today. Um, I'm Angela Lee. I'm the Marketing and Communication Chair of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association and the founder of uh, Contemporary by Angela Lee. So thank you very much for the thought-provoking discussion brought to us by Panel 1 uh, speakers, which prompt us to rethink Hong Kong's position against the backdrop of global cultural advancement. Up next, we have session two, of which the topic is outside the cube, what are the alternative models to traditional art galleries? This panel explores alternative physical models of gallery operations, as opposed to the traditional white cube gallery. Um, we are very happy to welcome the main speaker, Ing Ru Chen, founder of Praise Shadows Art Partners, who's visiting us from the US to share her ideas for sustaining the creative economy behind the gallery walls and her experience with blockchain technology. Focused on strategic and media advisory, as well as partnership and business development within the creative industries, she works directly with artists on project-driven missions while launching Snark Art, a groundbreaking tech startup that uses blockchain as an artist medium and as a marketplace. This panel will be looking at the different relationships that can be fostered between galleries and artists, as well as scrutinize the prospects of traditional models and new emerging forms or technologies that allow galleries to adapt, survive, and sustain within the increasingly competitive landscape. After her presentation, Ingru will be joined by the moderator, Willem Molesworth, director of Desarte and vice president of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association, who will introduce the rest of the panel which consists of directors of alternative art spaces. Apart from being one of the leading forces of the symposium together with Fabio Rossi, William is also prolific in staging exhibitions with contemporary artists such as Gang Xu, Li Liao, Liang Ban, and Liu Boling, to name a few. He's also the co-founder of Suitcase Institute with his wife, Yas Bao Cheng, a traveling platform for the initerant exhibition of art in any space or location. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Eng Ru Chen on stage. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me here, Willem, and uh, the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association. I also want to give a shout out to Jessica Kalakian, who was just a superstar organizer. Um, I am here from New York and from Boston, and it's very nice to be in warm Hong Kong. Um, I also would like to thank Asia Society for hosting this event. Um, I will be speaking about alternative models to the gallery system. I will be speaking from my own perspective, my own professional experiences and insights um, to talk about the diverse economic models that are out there for artists. But I also know that my experience is hardly the norm and uh, it does not complete the picture. So for that reason, I'm looking forward to the panel following this talk and learning from the peers um, on the panel. So how did I get here? Um, well, technically I flew here, but my work and my life are based in New York and Boston. So on a professional level, my road here has taken nearly 20 years. Um, I've worked in the arts and in the creative fields. I ran, uh, sorry, I, I was part of Asian Society's marketing and PR team in New York when the museum reopened in 2001. Um, this building here is amazing, but it didn't even exist when I was at Asia Society. So it's really nice to see it. Um, I ran the marketing and the press de department at MoMA PS1 in New York. Uh, there I worked with many living artists and um, honestly PS1 is one of the original alternative art spaces that um, is on the map in New York and provided a model for a lot of the work that I ended up doing. I also worked in the Chinese art department at Sotheby's in New York. Um, I worked with antiquities, I worked with paintings, um, and then I needed a break. I was really tired and I thought I need to leave the art world. And I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. 
So I really did. I left in uh, 2004, and in early 2015, I took a job in Brooklyn at this startup named Tally. And uh, at that time, the company was less than one year old. It was a true startup. I didn't really know what I was doing in it, but it seemed exciting. Um, I was a young mother to two children. I needed a really sane place to work. And uh, <laughs> I found that I had, a, I had a wonderful boss who uh, also didn't come from the art world, but is extremely creative and entrepreneurial. She started this company almost as a joke. Um, she's Swiss, she's a designer, and one day when her daughter came home wearing ugly temporary tattoos, she thought, I'm gonna design some or I'm gonna ask my friends to make some and we'll put up a fake website. And the next day the Tate Modern called and said, do you have a wholesale catalog? And she hung up the phone and said, what's a wholesale catalog? So we just improvised from day one. Um, but what was really fascinating when she hired me was I was able to do whatever I wanted to do. She knew that I came from the world of fine art, which honestly was completely unknown to her as a person from the design and commercial art field. So uh, when I came in, I saw the potential to work in the fine art space. And I started collaborating with the Guggenheim, with the Whitney. Um, and we started signing licensing deals with our fine, fine artists, not just commercial artists who, you know, um, honestly, I knew very little about, but I knew I wanted the Gorilla Girls. I knew I wanted more. And uh, under my watch, we signed licensing deals from, as you see here, the Gorilla Girls. We also signed a licensing deal with the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Um, I am a huge Albert Durer fan, and all I wanted was to wear Durer on my body. <laughs> and I wanted to share that knowledge of loving old masters with all kinds of audiences. Um, and honestly, the museum was very excited. They were always looking for ways to expand their audiences and in really innovative, creative, fun ways. Um, and that led to partnerships with Art Basel, with the Obama White House with um, countless other places, such as Vogue, Condé Nast. We even did a partnership with Bruce Lee. And um, that was probably, I always say, the most creative job I have ever had. And it wasn't even in the art world. So we also partnered with Christie's uh, back in New York. Um, they were looking for also a new way of attracting younger collectors for their old master's department. Um, I think it's not unknown that most people who collect old masters are not super young. And they took their exhibition and event budget and they worked with us. So we took a look at their upcoming sale and we extracted extracts from, or uh, sorry, details from some of these paintings. And we had this event. It was a huge success. Um, people ended up not wanting to go home. And the New York Times was there, and they put us on the front page of the style section. And it became this really interesting way for the art world in New York, which tradi traditionally, even though you know, in the museum world, we always said, how do we get younger audiences? How do we get new people to come in through our doors? But still, you have to ask them to come in through your doors. Here, we were telling people, here's an accessible thing. It's fun. There are no barriers. Um, just try it and it's temporary. So what was really interesting about Tatley's work is that we licensed the art and we gave a substantial cut to the artist. The artist was always recognized. And I'm really proud to say, even though I'm no longer with the company, that Tatley has paid out $1.3 million in royalties to artists. That is not very much money when you look at what Art Basel makes uh, you know, in a sale, but these are $5 products. These are products that anyone can get access to online and uh, in a museum shop or in a store. And you don't even have to, um, you know, the education is, is loaded with interest and fun, and it's not something that people find intimidating. So I took a lot of lessons from this job, but um, one of the biggest lessons was that passive income is really important to artists. We were working with commercial artists, designers, and fine artists, 
And some of these artists were able to get paid every quarter and have that amount help with their rent. Um, if you're an artist and you're living in Hong Kong or New York or, or Los Angeles, you, you know your rent is, and your studio rent is not insignificant. So having every little bit was really helpful. And I took this to heart when I was realizing that I needed to find my next step and do something entrepreneurial as well. And that was when I decided that with the work that I knew how to do and with my marketing PR background, I could do this for artists on project basis and, um, and look at ways of, tr of creating alternative income outside of the gallery system. This was a couple years ago when, to be honest, a lot of galleries, small and mid-sized galleries in New York were closing. Um, and a lot of my artist friends are represented, but they were still not seeing very much income. They might have a show every once a year, every once and a half years, um, but it's really, really hard. And I was constantly being approached by artists to say, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And some of them were showing at biennials, some of them have major museum shows, and they just said to me, look, curatorial praise does not equate to me being able to make a living from this. Um, and that was a really big step in taking my journey to this next, next part. Um, so I launched Praise Shadows Art Partners. I'm inspired by Tanizaki's book, In Praise of Shadows, where we're always looking at what's in the shadows. We're looking at beauty beyond the light. And I feel that artists and what we see in the gallery system, that's vital and that's crucial, but there's more. There's more potential for artists to um, find accessibility and find new audience, audiences and create income. So we work with institutions and companies on marketing strategy, um, but the bulk of our pro projects also relate to individual artists and creating for them an expert level of support um, while looking for new opportunities. So beyond licensing programs, which I just introduced to you, uh, we also look at project-based collaborations. And here uh, on the screen is one that we did in Shanghai with the Filipino-American artist James Klar. He was invited by this brand in uh, mainland China, which is the fastest growing apparel, apparel brand in Asia. And their creative director had actually met or uh, come across James's work in galleries in New York. And she said, my entire collection is based on James Clark, which is amazing. But then you also have to think, well, let's talk about this. How do we represent the artist in the right way with a collaboration? Um, so we took this to a whole new level where James then created three site-specific public art pieces in the middle of Shanghai over the summer. Uh, there was a whole big push, push out. And you know, one of the really interesting things was how much this brand wanted to elevate James and create this impression that he was an equal partner in this line. Um, you know, it's not something where this artist would collaborate with any brand. But here, they understood that he was crucial to their identity. And so, you know, this is not a work for hire. This is not where a company is paying the artist, not mentioning their names, and giving them a small fee. This is a significant collaboration. So these are the types of works that we are doing ar around the world, and we're looking at opportunities that artists um, you know, who are often sitting in their studio, not sitting, working very hard in their studio, but you know, may not have the foresight or the connections or the expertise to know what they can do to put their work out in the world. Um, and you know, one of the experiences I had that is separate from what James does, um, I met this older American artist out in the Midwest. She's a painter and uh, quite brilliant. And she had been approached by a very, very famous luxury brand. And uh, she said, they took my work and they put it on shirts and it was on the runway. These shirts are thousands of dollars. She was thrilled. And I said, congratulations. I assume they paid you royalties. I assume they paid you fairly. And she said, oh, they gave me a few thousand dollars and some shirts. I'm just really happy they paid me. And I feel like that is the, 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 that's the focus that we have to 
move away from. Artists need to know that they have agency, that they should be compensated fairly, and that they have a right to say, no, my work is actually a lot more valuable than what you're putting out there. Um, so this is the culture I'm trying to change. I'm trying to help empower the artists so that they can be paid fairly. And um, you know, we're advocating for them in the marketplace without having a gallery. Another work, another aspect of the work I do is creating relationships with institutions and museums. Um, and this is an example of one that's coming up on December 15th. Jeanette is a performance artist and a magician who is based in Chicago. And I've created uh, relationships with her in New York, which is where she really wants to focus. And she's gonna be doing a day-long program at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Um, you know, we recognize, just as with a traditional gallery, that you need the curatorial and the museum um, support as well as the marketplace in order to thrive. And at the same time, um, we also do need a physical space. I just don't feel like renting a permanent space. So um, in order for artists to have their work shown, you need to have it somewhere. And I was given this opportunity back in May during TAFOF and Freeze Week to mount an exhibition uh, with a, a friend of mine in this Park Avenue mansion that had been vacant for many, many years. And the, the developers were interested in trying to find new ways of showing the space. Um, it had been a residential building for a long time, but they said, maybe it's an art gallery, maybe it's a dentist's office, who knows? But you know, we created uh, three floors of exhibitions from video art to sculpture, um, and we made it free to the public. So it was thanks to these sort of collaborations where our artists were able to have a physical presence, even for a short period of time. And that led to an actual online gallery, which I was the first person to be completely surprised by this. But I was having a conversation with Artsy, and they said, you should have a gallery. You know, you've sold at this Park Avenue space. Um, this artist, Yuri Shimojo, she was on a, in an Artsy um, online benefit auction. And uh, there was quite a bidding war for her work. So it just seemed to make sense that, you know, a digital platform like Artsy could help support the work that we're doing. Um, and we're still, we're testing it out. This just happened last week, but with my background in marketing and especially now in this day and age with um, Facebook and Instagram ads, um, I'm trying to leverage this sort of audience, which is a brand new audience, and these works are not very expensive. Um, so, you know, opening up a whole new sector of people who would not necessarily have the ability to walk into a Park Avenue mansion, but would be able to access this kind of information online. Um, and of course, you know, with this, I'm bringing art uh, collectors and curators to the artist studios so that they can have that personal touch as well. Uh, here are just some of uh, the other artists that are on our Artsy Gallery. This is Emily Auchincloss, a Boston-based painter. Uh, John Bergerman, who's a very popular kind of street art um, abstract painter. Here is Yuri, again, this is the Japanese-American painter. And I'm really excited, next week in Miami, we are going to be presenting two video works um, as part of a digital art fair called Kadaf, which is going to take place at Mana Wynwood. And um, this is an artist that uh, some of you might be familiar with, Christoph Niemann, he's based in Berlin, and he illustrates many, many New Yorker covers. Um, he's hugely popular. Um, he has sold limited edition prints and original paintings before, but I saw that he was starting to t kind of experiment with video platforms. And so this is the first time a video work of his is going to be available to um, collectors. And here you can get a little preview. So this is an aerial shot uh, in Sao Paulo that he took. And in his very creative, idiosyncratic style, he's created a game of Pong using the street landscape. This is a one minute, uh, it's, it's a more than one minute video, but that was a little clip. Um, so in my remaining time, I'm going to finally talk about blockchain and the digital future for art. Um, how many people raise your hands know what or have heard of blockchain? 
okay, so like that's not that's not bad. Um, I will say last year when I was really talking about this ad nauseum, very few people in the art world knew about it. And suddenly in Miami, uh, Art Basel last year, every single art fair had you know at least one blockchain um, talk. Um, but I'm going to talk about blockchain not as anything specific. And please know like. With my seven minutes left, I'm going to really just scratch the surface. Um, and you can come find me later if we want to have a deeper conversation. But this is a really interesting platform because it doesn't just have connotations and implications for the art market, but it has um, a lot of potential for artists as a creative medium. Um, so here on the screen, you'll see an image that looks like Last Meaningness by Velasquez. Um, but it's actually a work by Eve Sussman. And she created the very first project on snark.art, which was a company that I helped launch uh, late last year. And um, I think it's a very interesting project. So I'm going to let her talk to you about it. Um, it. But just before I go here, here's blockchain. This was actually an excerpt from Art Asia Pacific, uh, which the founders of snark.art wrote last year. Um, I just want everyone to know that this is not Bitcoin. It's not cryptocurrency. I didn't even know what Bitcoin was when I entered into this space. I was really more interested in blockchain as um, a, a way of helping art and artists. But you can read that. You'll see that blockchain is just the underlying technology. It's a ledger technology. It helps record information. And it's a really good record of information. Crypto or blockchain is the currency. But they're not, they're not the same. My name is Eve Sussman, and I'm an artist and a filmmaker, and I'm doing a project with snark.art. About 15 years ago, I created a video work called 89 Seconds at Alcazar that was inspired by Las Meninas, the Velasquez painting in the Prado. When I created the piece, what I really wanted was sort of to be a fly on the wall in, in the salon in the Alcazar where Velasquez painted Las Meninas. And so that meant having to actually rebuild that room, to, to create the room to scale, to study the architecture, to find these scholarly art historical documents that actually showed you the floor plan of the palace and where people might have been in the space. And, and then to actually figure out how a camera could be a fly on the wall and circumnavigate that room. 89 Seconds at Alcazar has toured all over the world. It's in museum collections in different countries. Um, and it's, it's been shown a lot. And at some point, I sort of thought, oh, well, the piece has perhaps been shown enough. Maybe, maybe this is it now. We can put that piece to bed. And then Misha and Andre from snark.art came to me and said, do you want to propose something? And it suddenly dawned on me that what made sense to propose was a reimagining, a re-envisioning of 89 Seconds at Alcazar into what we're calling 89 Seconds Atomized. And so we're actually shattering the piece into over 2,000 pieces, blocks, 20 pixels by 20 pixels, and creating a version of it that can be acquired by up to 2,304 people and be kind of a, almost a community artwork. Video makers for a long time have worked in the tradition of photographers and printmakers in that they editioned their work. And that was a way partly to make a living, that if you made a limited edition and you sold it as a limited edition, you could potentially make a living from selling those limited pieces. The problem was that they were limited. And, and that is often something people complain about. You know, How do I get to see it? Where is it? How come I can't own it too? Um, how come it's sold out? So making a 89 seconds atomized, a blockchain artwork from my original piece, 89 Seconds at Alcazar, is a chance to turn the piece into something that is owned by a community. So it's a whole new way of thinking about how a limited edition can be acquired and what can happen with it and what kind of life it can have. The creation of 89 Seconds at Alcazar was about kind of trying to go deeper into the frame. Like, can I actually step into that room and be a fly on the wall in the room? And then can the camera fly around that room? And 
now the creation of 89 Seconds atomized is sort of taking yet another step deeper. Instead of stepping deeper into the room, we're sort of stepping deeper into the pixels. We're stepping deeper into the uh, structure and the foundation of what makes the piece run. And so that, to me, is kind of an extension of what was going on when we originally created the piece, which is how do you get further inside it? How do you get inside the picture? Because I was one of those kids that always took stuff apart and couldn't necessarily always put it back together. But with blockchain, I'm actually guaranteed that it can get put back together. The responsibility of having to get put back together is suddenly not on my shoulders anymore. And so even in this studio, you can see how there's a lot of stuff I've taken apart. And um, you know, I always think, I'm going to get back to putting it back together. And then somehow you never get around to it. And so there's sort of this relief that, oh, I can shatter this thing apart, and it'll miraculously get reassembled because of the power of the blockchain and because of the power of the community that own it. And they will take responsibility, or I hope they will. That's the experiment. But I'm excited to see if that experiment is going to work. So Eve's piece, the original video, premiered at the Whitney Biennial in 2004. There were 10 editions of it, all sold out immediately. Um, and you know, video work is not something that museums put up in their permanent galleries all the time. Um, so in this use case of snark.art and uh, Eve's work, um, for example, I own one, one of these 20 by 20 pixel blocks, it was $125. Um, but if I wanted to, I could request a loan from the entire community of owners. And for a short period of time, I could screen that right here. There will be sections that will be dark because they're not claimed yet by an owner. Um, and that makes it a, a different kind of artwork. But it also means that there's a collective ownership level here. It's not dependent on one owner or one institution to put that work on the wall. There is now um, you know, this collective of people who are able to screen it wherever they want. There was a screening in Kazakhstan. You know, there are screenings all over the world. Um, and that's what the artist wants. She wants to democratize her art. So uh, for SNARK, this is definitely a platform that is really more about using it as a creative medium. Like I said, there is no, you know, you can pay with Bitcoin if you want, but it's not about that. It's about how artists can use new technologies to share their works with more people, especially when it comes to digital art and new media art. It's difficult, and it's difficult to try and monetize that. Um, this is still like Internet 1.0. I mean, don't get me wrong, we, there's a lot going on that has to be developed, but I guarantee you this is the future. There's going to be more and more applications of how blockchain is going to be used. Um, another interesting thing that I'll just point out here is that, at least in the United States, you know, artists don't get secondary sales royalties. On the blockchain, um, if a work is coded with the artist ownership, there is the potential for the artist to continue to receive royalties past the first owner. So this is a very attractive um, type of technology and concept for artists in the United States. Um, and I would definitely encourage all artists who are interested in new media to experiment and to seek out companies like SNARK who are um, really kind of doing groundbre groundbreaking work. There's another company called Artery. Uh, I'm sure many, many of you have heard of it if you're a collector. They, um, are really more focused on provenance. And um, the founder is uh, the chairman of TFAF. And you know, there is the there's the way, there's this way of trying to overcome the art market's um, opaque nature. You know, how do you know someone actually collected this in the past? How do you know it was for that price? Um, this information is on the, on the blockchain, it's a ledger. It's not necessarily something I will, I won't know who it is, but that code is, is information that really can't be changed um, because it's dependent on this entire chain of command and this entire chain of information to change any of it. So this uh, Edward Hopper work was sold at Christie's last year for more than $90 million. It's registered on Artery. And the next time it transfers ownership, that information will be verified. Um, and they are now doing this you know, with uh, video artists, with tangible art. So it has applications um, for all kinds of mediums. Um, and you know, one of the things that people get really excited about with blockchain is the transparency. Like I said, it's a ledger. It's not, you know, this is my book in the back of my gallery. I'm not going to show anybody what's going on. This is really um, information that the 
that people have access to. Um, it's coded, it's hashed. There are ways of, um, you know, kind of encrypting who the actual people are. But uh, on a very basic level, this is how we can track ownership of artwork. This is how artists can track, you know, where their artworks are going in the future and where they were in the past. Um, there are tons of companies now in this area. Um, this is one that I'm actually not that familiar with, but I found it interesting. It's called Makerspace, and the employee was, uh, sorry, the founder was employee number one at Pinterest, which, as you may know, is a, you know, is a very, very, very popular social media network where you pin anything. Um, but it's very popular for pinning artworks. The problem is the artists who are getting their works pinned, they get nothing from that. Maybe exposure and attention, but they're not getting paid. So uh, this company is working with digital artists that they invite who now have their own kind of digital storefronts. Um, but with the artists, they can control proof of ownership. They can control how their works are sold. Um, they can also control scarcity, which is a really important aspect, as all of you know, for collecting in the art world and for selling artworks. Um, the problem with digital art is, you know, it could just go out there. If a meme is a meme, it'll be shared a million times. However, now with blockchain, if something is hashed as, you know, this is the owner, this is how and when and for how much this work was purchased, um, even if a million people are sharing the same digital work, I own it. And uh, when I sell it, I have the right to sell that. And the artist has the right to receive royalties from that. So it gives power to collectors and to digital artists in a big way. Um, this is a company called Otis. It's based in the US as well. And um, to be honest, I don't know if they're using blockchain technology, but they're, they're working with a, a format called uh, fractional ownership. Fractionalized ownership is something that Basically, you can think about it as shares. You know, if you own a co-op, if you own sh if you own stock, you don't actually have access to it in a physical way, um, but you will have access to the profit if it sells um, at a later date. So this company is uh, very interesting in a way because they've taken their first work. It was a Kahinda Wiley that they purchased for a uh, quarter of a million dollars. Um, and when they opened sales, you could buy a share for as low as $25 into as high as $25,000. And uh, in about a month and a half, they sold out all of the shares. Now, where is this work? It's sitting in a gallery. They have a space in New York City. Um, I, will I don't own shares, but if I did, I would never be able to bring it into my home. I would never have access to it except to see it in this space. Um, but what they are looking at uh, in a way is trying to create um, a new kind of collector base for art. Um, I think they understand that, especially nowadays, you know, really popular artists like Hinde, like Cause, those are works that you can't uh, readily purchase, if at all. So how do you get people interested in collecting art? How do you create a little bit more mobility for uh, this generation of art collectors that are primarily online? Um, but it is an interesting concept. You know, when I started talking about blockchain with people, a lot of collectors just couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that this is not physical work for the most part. Um, you are never going to own it. And if you're a collector that cares about that relationship, then this might not be for you or Otis in particular. But if you're just curious about, you know, maybe I'll see how much this Kahende might be sold for in five to 10 years. Um, maybe I'll feel proud of that. Maybe this will be my first step in collecting more. They're trying to make collecting a little bit more accessible to um, the general public and honestly to people with plenty of income that are not currently active in the art world. Um, and aren't we all trying to find more people who are with, you know, who have disposable income but who don't really know how to start? Plenty of people do not know how to go into a gallery. Um, you know, I've taken many people to auction houses for the free exhibitions, and most of my friends assume you have to pay or be invited to even walk in. So there is a huge barrier to physical entry right now in the art world. Um, and with some of these platforms, they are trying to break down those walls. But it's very early still, so you know, maybe in five years I'll come back and give a report on what is happening um, with uh, digital technology. Um, and my time is up, which is crazy. I want to thank everybody for listening, and I just want to reiterate that you know all of the work that we do at Prey Shadows is about empowering artists, empowering audiences to appreciate art. There was a comment earlier that we don't need hundreds and hundreds of artists in the, in the world. 
You know, I mean, I, I think if you asked an artist, they would think, but I need this, I need to survive. And how am I going to survive if I live in New York because I need to make my work known to curators? Um, there is a huge struggle right now. And I think with economic uncertainty and with political uncertainty, um, we need to look at diversifying how art is being sold, how artists are making their work and how they are being um, approached by new audiences. So thank you, and I would be happy to talk to anybody later. Okay.